Hey guys, it's Metacosis Perfect Snatus where medicine makes perfect sense. Let's continue our biochemistry playlist. In previous videos, we talked about vitamins, the fat soluble vitamins like vitamin K, vitamin E, vitamin D, and vitamin A, as well as the water soluble vitamins like vitamins B and vitamin C. We also talked about the vitamin like substance choline. Then we started talking about minerals like zinc, copper, selenium iodine and even chromium today we shall review all of these minerals very quickly especially what happens when you are deficient in one of these minerals but excessive minerals could also be a problem especially on your kidney tubules as we have discussed before do not overdo it everything in moderation nothing in excess as an ancient wise man once said please watch the videos in this playlist in order remember nutrients are either macronutrients or micronutrients the macronutrients are carbohydrates, proteins, and fat, grams per day. The micronutrients are vitamins or minerals, milligrams per day. The vitamins are water-soluble or fat-soluble. The minerals are macro-minerals or micro-minerals. The macro-minerals generally, not always, are required in an amount of more than 100 milligrams per day. But micro is usually less than 100. That's why you call them micro or trace elements. The macros include a calcium, magnesium, sodium, potassium, chloride, and phosphate. The micro-minerals or trace elements include iron, iodine, zinc, copper, chromium, selenium, manganese, molybdenum, fluoride, and boron. Vitamins are coenzymes or precursors to coenzymes, but minerals are cofactors to enzymes. Some of these minerals belong to the alkali or alkaline earth metals, others belong to the transition metals. And there are five groups of nutrients as we have discussed before, so please pause and review. If you want to learn more about these, check out my electrolytes course. As for today, we'll focus on these trace elements whose deficiency can be serious, but usually not fatal. And here is a lovely comparison between vitamins and minerals. Pause and review. Some of these minerals are in your bones, like calcium, phosphate. Minerals are small in size, inorganic, water-soluble. You need them in your diet. They can be building units for bones, teeth, hemoglobin, myoglobin. Calcium and phosphate are here. Iron is here. About one-third of the enzymes in your body require one mineral or another as a cofactor. So we call these enzymes metalloenzymes, like the famous metalloproteinases. These are proteinases, i.e. enzymes that digest proteins, but they need a mineral as a cofactor metalloproteinases or metalloproteases same thing and since enzymes are catalysts and minerals are helping enzymes so minerals are helping in the catalytic process moreover minerals stabilize your dna and rna especially magnesium and don't forget the lovely cobalt from which cobalamin or vitamin b12 is derived so there you have it your nutrients in one slide so let's review these minerals zinc first Zinc deficiency can lead to poor growth, no pubic hair, hypogonadism, loss of sense of smell, which affects my sense of taste, loss of gustin will make me lose my sense of taste, and poor wound healing, subjective ringing in the ear, inflammation of the lips, and white nails, and don't forget the famous acrodermatitis enteropathica, inflammation of the lips and rash around the mouth, weak immunity, increasing my risk of infections, eye problems, neuropsychiatric issues, and pregnancy complications. Zinc is needed for many enzymes. Do not forget the carbonic anhydrase. Do not forget DNA polymerase and RNA polymerase. That's why without zinc, you get poor wound healing, as well as decreased growth and development. No gustin, no gustatory impulses, no gustatory sensation, decreasing my sense of taste and smell. Collagenase needs zinc. That's why zinc deficiency will lead to poor tissue regeneration and repair and poor wound healing. Don't forget get the autosomal recessive acrodermatitis enteropathica where I have defective zinc absorption. Too much copper interferes with zinc absorption. Conversely, too much zinc interferes with copper absorption. So excessive zinc leads to copper deficiency and excessive copper leads to zinc deficiency because they compete for the same protein, metallothionine. Many of the hormones, especially the fat-soluble hormones whose receptor is inside the cell, not the outside, work via 
zinc fingers and before you know it you're modulating your gene expression transcription translation etc add to that the fact that rna polymerase and dna polymerase require zinc vitamin d receptor is linked to zinc fingers and that's why if i have a zinc finger mutation vitamin d will not work and i will get rickets as a youngster next copper deficiency can lead to iron deficiency anemia because you need copper in order to absorb iron. It will also lead to poor wound healing, bone problems, hair problems, kinky hair, or gray hair in a child with the congenital Menkes disease. Nerve problems, increasing my risk of heart attacks and strokes because of hyperlipidemia or high cholesterol in the blood. And Menke's disease will have poor development, poor growth, and kinky gray hair. Copper is in your liver, hepatocuprin, and your red blood cells, erythrocuprin, and in your brain, cerebrocuprin. Many enzymes need copper in order to function, especially the famous lysyl oxidase to make collagen and elastin. That's why without copper, your vessels are fragile, your wounds do not heal, your bones are weak, and when your vessels are fragile, what's gonna happen? Dissection, aneurysms. You need copper for the famous tyrosinase, without which there is no melanin. No melanin, no pigmentation. That's why the youngster had gray hair. Also, copper is needed as a cofactor for an enzyme known as C18 delta 9 desaturase, which converts a saturated fatty acid into a monounsaturated fatty acid which is less evil that's why without copper i get hyperlipidemia elevated blood cholesterol increasing my risk of heart attacks and strokes you need copper for ferroxidase so that you can absorb iron so without copper you get iron deficiency anemia and one of the causes of copper deficiency is zinc excess coming up next Chromium, also known as glucose tolerance factor. Without chromium, I increase my insulin resistance, decrease my glucose tolerance, and I get peripheral neuropathy, just like a diabetic. Why? Because chromium is pro-insulin. It facilitates the action of insulin on its insulin receptor on the target cell such as skeletal muscles or adipose tissue. Chromium helps insulin perform its function. That's why we call chromium glucose tolerance factor. How did chromium achieve this? By giving us chromodulin, which is a protein that modulates chromium to facilitate insulin binding to its receptor to give us all of the actions of insulin. That's why you call chromium glucose tolerance factor. Without chromium, you get diabetes-like symptoms. Next, selenium. It's famous in some shampoos, selenium shampoos, for malassezia furfur, which causes the disease tinea versicolor, where you have areas of depigmentation and hyperpigmentation. Symptoms of selenium deficiency include muscle pain and weakness, endemic cardiomyopathy, and endemic osteoarthritis when you live in an area where the soil is deficient in selenium. Therefore, your food will also be selenium deficient. Selenium Selenium is a free radical scavenger, just like vitamin E, so they help one another, they decrease the burden of one another. Selenium is pro-glutathione peroxidase, which protects you from the hydrogen peroxide free radicals. That's why without selenium you get toxicity. You get problems in your muscles, problems in your heart, problems in your joints, probably due to free radical injury. Peroxidations of the lipid in the lipid bilayer membrane of the tissues of these respective organs. Who gets mineral deficiencies? Anyone who's severely malnourished, anyone who's on total parental nutrition in the hospital, when you cannot eat, they will feed you through veins. Sometimes the doctor is a doofus and forgets to supply these essential minerals. So you get mineral deficiency, especially if this is done over a prolonged period of time. When it comes to selenium, plant sources are richer than animal sources. But when it came to zinc, it was the other way around. Next, iodine. Important for your thyroid gland. If you live in an area where iodine is deficient, you can develop goiter. The thyroid needs iodine as a raw material to make thyroid hormone. Look at that, here is iodide entering into the thyroid follicular cell 
Before you know it, you're making your thyroid hormone. How do you recycle the iodine? How do you clip that iodine and return it back to the thyroid? You need a deiodinase. There is a deiodinase in the thyroid and there is deiodinase in the peripheral tissue. This deiodinase enzyme requires selenium, by the way. Iodine is important for you to make thyroid hormone. Without iodine, your thyroid is deficient cannot make thyroid hormone, you end up with hypothyroidism. And as a result of the low T3 and T4, the hypothalamus will shout louder and the pituitary will shout louder. Shout what? Profanities? Shut up. The hypothalamus will shout out TRH. The pituitary will shout out TSH. And TSH is food for the thyroid. TSH will make my thyroid gland grow, causing goiter. So just because my thyroid gland is big in size does not necessarily mean that it is robust in function. You could have a big thyroid gland, yet it's not making thyroid hormone, as in cases of iodine deficiency. See, medicine makes so much sense once you understand what the flip you're talking about. Radioactive iodine is toxic to the thyroid gland. Selenium toxicity can lead to the infamous blind staggers where I cannot see and cannot walk. Copper toxicity is seen in Wilson disease, and I can end up with copper overload in my brain. You can learn more about copper toxicity, mercury poisoning, lead poisoning, arsenic poisoning, cadmium poisoning, and much more by downloading my toxicology course at medicosisperfectsnellis.com. Do you want to learn about insulin, the types of insulin, how you calculate the dose of insulin for patients with diabetes, what is diabetic ketoacidosis? What is hyperosmolar hyperglycemic non-ketotic syndrome? You can learn about all of this by downloading my endocrine pharmacology course at medicosisperfectionalis.com. If you do not want to download my premium courses and would rather watch them right here on YouTube, just click on the join button and choose the highest tier to gain instant access to more than 300 premium videos. Please subscribe and hit the bell. Support my channel here or here. Go to my website to download my courses, notes, and cases. Be safe, stay happy, study hard. This is Medicosis Perfectionalis, where medicine makes perfect sense.